The Lord be with you, Pillar community, near and far. Whatever brings you to worship with us today, we're grateful to share in this space. Whatever you carry, whatever you come with, whatever is on your heart and your mind, um, we're with you. Uh, we, we gather together collectively to worship God, and he meets us right where we are. My name is Jenna. I'm one of the pastors here at Pillar and we have the privilege of being joined uh, by Juan John Wagenveld, who is the founder and director of Multiplication Network Ministries and a part of the Pillar community. And he is here with us this morning to offer God's word. And so we're so grateful that he would do so. As we gather ourselves for worship, um, Let's take just a few moments to settle ourselves, to quiet our bodies, our minds. They just, they are distracted. They wander. We wander. Um, settle ourselves, quiet ourselves before the Lord. The ensemble will lead us. Peace. 
the spirit and the bride say come. Let everyone who hears say come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. Friends, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has called us here to worship, and we in turn rejoice and turn back to him in thanks. So let's continue worshiping as we sing this morning. Spirit and the bride say come. Let everyone who hears say come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. There are so many places we thirst for, so many things we long for, so many areas in which we need God's water of life, aren't there? This past week, we as a nation acknowledged Juneteenth and the freedom journey that it points to. And we celebrate the ways in which all of us have been created bearing God's image. Even as we lament the ways that we divide ourselves racially and beyond. We also lament the violence that continues to persist in our lives as a week ago on Sunday, another in our Holland community was shot and killed. So would you join us as we pray, as we pray to the God who hears our longings, who quenches our thirsts? Let's pray. Gracious God, We long for your water of life. Your water of life that brings healing, restoration, wholeness, and peace. How long until our thirst for justice is quenched, Lord? How long until violence and hurt are done forever? 
We pray amid is the death of Joseph Roberts. We long for the day when violence isn't even an option anymore. Your mercy meet us in our time of deepest need. Amid is the scene of our lives, the scene of the world. And so we ask for mercy, Lord, for forgiveness, for restoration. We need your mercy until the day when all races and nations can live in peace. When there is no more hatred based on skin color. When there is no more judgment based on where you come from. When we can fully and honestly listen to each other. And know each other's needs and carry each other's burdens. We trust that even today amidst both pain and hope. That you Jesus are reconciling all things to yourself. That your love calls us saying come. That no matter what we have done or what we fail to do, you gather us in yourself and offer salvation and life to our thirsty souls. Have mercy, come Lord Jesus. As we continue praying, let's sing.
Amen. Friends, his mercy is more. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. Believe this and be at peace. Friends, the peace that we have in Christ is what enables us and calls us and urges us on in pursuing peace in our own lives and in the world around us. And so there are so many ways that you're going to go about that in your own way, on your own time. And there are also ways that we pursue that together as a community. Um, And I want to share a couple of things with you this morning on that front. First of all, uh, all of the opportunities available through Pillar to pursue peace and otherwise are available through a weekly email that we send out on Wednesdays. If you'd like to receive that and don't yet, please just email office at pillarchurch.com. And there's also a, an opportunity to give if you go on our website, pillarchurch.com, um, and if you are able to support the mission and ministry of the church in that way, we'd be so grateful. A couple of things happening this week on Tuesday evening. We'll have our monthly Belong gathering. Belong is a community, a thriving community of people of all abilities. And we gather once a month to uh, worship, to eat, to fellowship, and to play with one another. And this summer we're continuing our journey through the I Am statements of Jesus. And um, so please join us on Tuesday night from 6 to 7.30. We'll meet here at Pillar in the gathering space. And then on Wednesday, um, we'll, do, we'll have Christ in the City. We began our Christ in the City series this past Wednesday, and we're going to go through, um, through August 9, uh, sorry, August 3rd. And our theme for Christ in the City this summer is listening in a loud world an essential practice for a missionary congregation. Listening in a loud world. Does that resonate with you? We're, we gathered our theme, in, we we're inspired for this theme by D, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who has this quote, and I want you to listen well. He writes, many people are looking for an ear that will listen. They do not find it among Christians because these Christians are talking where they should be listening. So we're going to gather on Wednesday nights um, from 5.30, uh, dinner, a dinner hour opportunity to gather on the lawn, and then we move inside at 6.30 to be led in a conversation around this theme from one of our community leaders and teachers. And so join us this Wednesday, and we'll be led this week by Keith Van Beek, um, and he will be leading the conversation around listening to the community. Keeping all of these things in mind, um, and as we prepare to hear God's word, uh, let's sing together, To Whom Shall We Go?
To whom else shall we go if only you have words of eternal life? I'd like to thank the worship team that week after week helps us to come to Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate, and worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank you. Thank you also for the privilege for bringing the Word incarnate and the Word inscripturated in the Bible. We have words that Jesus spoke, and we'll be looking at these words that Jesus said, I will build my church, and that is the message that we are bringing today. First of all, I'd like to thank Pillar Church, Angela and I and our family. We just love this community of faith. Uh, we've been here now six or seven years, and we just love participating with this community and the ministry that it's been called to in reconciling the world to Christ. And so for that, we're grateful. We're also thankful for the partnership that we have between Pillar Church and the Multiplication Network. Together in 2021, we planted over 6,000 churches, verifiable communities of faith, people who were trained in a year-long process so that they could establish new communities of faith in their different contexts and Africa, Asia, and particularly in our partnership with Pillar in Latin America. So I want to say a big thank you to the congregation as a whole and those individuals and families who also support Multiplication Network to make this work possible. Thank you once again for the privileges of uh, preaching uh, this day. One of the stories that I remember is the story of Berea. Maria lives outside of Guayaquil, Ecuador, in a small town called Juhan. And as she was growing up in a very poor neighborhood, in a difficult family situation, she started looking for love in all the wrong places. Eventually, she got pregnant, had the baby. The father of the baby soon abandoned her. She turned for comfort to alcohol and started experimenting with drugs. And little by little, her life started spiraling down. And she said to us that eventually she was thinking of exiting life and committing suicide. Just at about that time when she was having these kind of thoughts, a church planter who was trained came into her life, into her path, and said to her, there's a man who can love you truly, a man who can love you well, a man who can love you where you are, but not leave you where you are, take you to a better place, a place of faith, a place of hope, and a place of love. And his name is Jesus. After sharing the gospel with her, Maria, having nothing left to lose, she, she, she accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of her life. And hope started to dwell in her heart. Maria then started participating in the church life, attending Bible studies, participating with other women. Eventually, she started using the gifts that God had put in her, and she started a community garden, helping her community with the food that came from that garden and building relationships through the gardening and the cultivation of that lot. She then started helping with ministry to children, and eventually, yes, she herself with her husband, a new man that the Lord brought into her life, somebody who followed Christ, together they went through training and started a new community of faith. Maria, who at one point felt worthless, now found that in Jesus she was actually beautiful and valuable to the kingdom. And it is people like Maria who are the building blocks of the church that Jesus himself is building when he says, I will build my church. Praise be to God for stories such as these that we get every week uh, hearing testimonies and seeing the pictures and the videos of what God is doing in our partnership. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, 
Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we look at the literary and historical context of this passage, one of the things that I noted was that the word ecclesia that we have where Jesus says, I will build my church, that word appears 114 times in the New Testament. But it only appears twice in all of the Gospels. In other words, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we only have the word ecclesia twice. And both times in this book that we're looking at today, the book of Matthew, and one of them in this passage, Matthew 16. And we just uh, recited verses 13 through 19. This passage is mainly about the identity of Jesus. There is a declaration that takes place here, and traditionally theologians, when they look at this passage, they will point out that uh, Jesus is looking at the cave there in, in uh, Caesarea Philippi, and he is saying to them, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, that even the debauchery and the uh, cult, the fertility cult that is going on there, that will not prevail against the advancement of the kingdom of God. But the main point of this whole paragraph is that Jesus is indeed, as Peter had the privilege of saying, he is uh, uh, telling the disciples around and later declaring to the world that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament, and he is the one that was awaited for by God's people. He indeed is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. He is the son of the living God. As we look at this passage, uh, we, we are reminded that often Catholics and Protestants will have a debate about this particular scripture, the Catholics emphasizing that it was Peter who said this, and so that the, what Jesus is saying is that he will build his church based on Peter and the primacy of Peter among his disciples. Protestants like to emphasize usually that, no, it's what Peter confessed, and Jesus actually praises that this was not from something that was revealed by flesh and blood, but this was actually revealed to you by my Father in heaven. What was it that was revealed? The confession that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the promised one, that Jesus is indeed the Son of the living God. But I would like to focus today on the phrase that says, I will build my church. These key words of Jesus. And so a question comes to mind, did God build anything else before? And so I'd like to look at three things in the Old Testament that God built. And then we'll look at three conclusions of application for us. First, after the creation of the world, we know that God's people are growing and multiplying, but then as sin has come into the world, there is brokenness, there is violence, there is wickedness, there is corruption. It says in Genesis 6 that God saw, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And so God instructs Noah to build something. He says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks, and I'm going to bring the floodwaters on the earth. And a little later, it says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So who gives the order for the ark to be built? God does. Who gives the design and the pattern? God does. 
But who actually builds the ark? Noah has the privilege of building the ark. And the result of that obedience is that life is preserved on the earth and blessing continues for humanity. The people of God again multiply, the earth is filled, and eventually the people of God are taken to Egypt and they're in slavery. And now they are going to be released by, uh, by God who tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. They go into the desert and they are going to wander for 40 years. And then God has Moses build something. He says to him that he's going to build a tabernacle. He says this in Exodus chapter 25. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Have them make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. And there are so many more details here in Exodus. But then it ends saying, uh, make a table of acacia wood, make a lampstand of pure gold. And at the end in verse 40, see that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And so who gives the order for this tabernacle to be built. God does. Who gives the design and the pattern? God does. But who actually builds the tabernacle? Moses builds it. And the result was that then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the result of this was glory that came down among God's people. And there's a third thing that then God has built. The people are now out of slavery. They've made it to the promised land. And people are building homes. They're planting vineyards. And all of a sudden, King David says many years later, we don't have a house for the Lord. The Lord does not have a dwelling place. And he has an idea that God needs a place to dwell. But God speaks to David and says this in 1 Chronicles 28. He said to me, Solomon, your son, is the one who will build my house and my courts, and I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you. Now that God speaks to Solomon. To build a house as a sanctuary, be strong and do the work. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries of the dedicated things. And a few verses later, all this David said, I have in writing as a result of the Lord's hand on me and he enabled me to understand all the details of the plan. And so David also said to Solomon, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. So who gives the order for the temple to be built? God does. Who gives the pattern and the design for the temple to be built? God does. But who actually builds it? Solomon has the privilege of building the temple. And what is the result? It says later in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, when they're about to dedicate the temple, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And listen to this. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good, his love endures forever. 
So the result was that there was glory that came down into the temple, and the glory was so incredible that the, even the priests could not enter, and the result was that people put their faces down to the pavement and worshipped God. So we've seen three things that God built in the Old Testament. We saw Noah was the one that actually got to build the ark. We saw that Moses was the one that actually got to build the tabernacle. And we saw that it was Solomon who actually got to build the, the temple. And so we have the ark, the tabernacle, and the temple. But now we come to this New Testament passage that we're looking at today. And Jesus says here that he, this is so important, he's not going to let anybody else build it. He puts it on himself. Jesus says, he declares, I will build my church. And so I'd like us to look at this phrase for a moment. I, it is personal. Jesus identifies with his church. He is the head of the church. We are the body. But together, the church belongs to Christ. I will build my church. We see this later in the New Testament when in, in the book of Acts, when Paul has his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, and, and, and Jesus speaks to him. He asks him not, why do you persecute my disciples? Why do you persecute the church? Jesus asks him, why do you persecute me? Jesus so identifies with his church that he says to Paul, why do you persecute me? He says, I will build. This will build. How does this happen? The building of the church is inspired and edif it's an edification animated by the Holy Spirit. Craig Van Gelder, a professor now retired from both Calvin and Luther Seminary, says that his favorite term for the church is the community of faith born of the Spirit. It is through the Spirit that Jesus can say, I will build my church. And he said, calls it my church because we will see later also in the book of Acts that it says that the church was purchased by the price of blood. Jesus gave his own blood to purchase the church is one of the expressions used in the New Testament in terms of the personal re uh, relationship that Jesus has with his body. I will build my church. Ken Miedema, the the blind and wonderful poet and singer says, this is a structure that is not built with wood and stone, but is built of flesh and bone. So Jesus will not leave this building to anyone else. He does not delegate it. He does not assign it. It's not the CRC committee or the RCA committee or some group at your local church. No, or at even our church. No, it is Jesus himself who says, I will build my church. So what is the church supposed to do then? If we look at the passage, and I remember the first time I uh, was taught this, I was amazed. It was one of those aha moments, and maybe it'll be that way for you, that while Jesus builds the church, he does give the church the keys of the kingdom. So it is not us who gets to build the church. Jesus will do that. But we do get to point to the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus says to Peter that he will build the church, but he gives to Peter the keys of the kingdom and this phrase that anything you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And anything that you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. An authority that is given from on high to the church to reconcile all things in the world and all of creation back to Jesus himself. And for this, we have been given the Spirit. So three conclusions. As we bear witness, because that's what we do. Jesus builds the church. We bear witness to the kingdom with those keys that we've been given. Three things that we can say. First, the church is sent. We know that in John 20, 21, Jesus says very clearly, As the Father sent me, so send I you. And he gave the great commission to the disciples to go and bear witness to the kingdom 
throughout the world. We know that the church is sent from this passage because it says that even the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Gates are not something that moves, and you've probably heard this many times. Gates are something that, a structure that are, that are static. It is the church, rather, that is advancing against those gates. It's the, the, there's an old Semitic expression that those gates of Hades would bring to mind to the original hearers that this is the threshold of the realm of death. So death, destruction, despair, and all its minions in life and in our society, those are things that are going to be confronted by the power of the gospel through the Spirit in the name of Jesus and for the glory of the Father. And so it is the church that is sent into the world advancing not in a, in a mentality of here we are in a fortress and hell attacking us, but rather the church and the gospel advancing as we bear witness to the kingdom. See, the way it works is the Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Spirit. The Spirit empowers the church, and the church is supposed to continue with that blessing into the world. But sometimes it gets stuck. The Father sends it the blessing to the Son. The Son sends the Holy Spirit. He has promised the Holy Spirit. He sends the Spirit at Pentecost, which we celebrate every year, the, the power that has been given to the church. And then the church sometimes wants to keep its blessing for itself rather than doing what it's been commissioned to do to bless the world and to bless the nations as the Trinitarian God would wish us to do. Emil Bruner says it this way, the church exist by mission as fire exists by combustion. In other words, when you see flames and smoke, you know there's fire there. If you're going to see the church, it can't be just a civic club or an ethnic club or a, a, just a gathering. It's a gathering with a purpose for mission. It is very specific. We've been given the keys of the kingdom. The church is sent. Number two, the church is social. We are a community. We are gathered and then scattered. We are saved and we are sent. We are a community that bears a witness to the kingdom by the way that we treat one another. N.T. Wright, uh, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, says that we are a community that it reflects the image of God, not only back to God, but as a prism into the world. And we gather the praises of creation and bring them back and offer them to God. We can only do this in community. Someone once said, there are many things that you can do alone, but Christianity is not one of them. We bear witness to the kingdom of God, not only being sent but also being social and being the community that reflects the image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the perfect community. And as imperfect as we might do it, with the help of the Spirit, we can care for one another, we can forgive one another, we can bear e each other's burdens, and we can together give witness to God's grace. Peter, who's one of the actors in the story that we read today, will later in his older life right in 1 Peter 2 5 saying to the church now in the in mature in his maturity of his walk with the Lord he says you are living stones being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood unto God this reminds me of a saying of C.S. Lewis that you might be able to see on your screen where C.S. Lewis talks to us first individually but with a corporate implication this is what C.S. Lewis says. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, as so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage but he is building a palace, and he intends to come and live in it 
himself. A beautiful story that C.S. Lewis shares of how God, even though it can cause some pain, is coming to dwell in us. But not just individually, he also lives in us corporately. So the church is sent, the church is social, and third and final point, the church is also a sign. Leslie Newbigin says this of the church, the church is a sign, instrument, and foretaste of the kingdom of God. A foretaste in the same way that you might walk into an ice cream store and they give you a, little, a couple little spoon, plastic spoons and you can try the different ice creams as a foretaste of which is the one that you would like to have that day. The church is a foretaste to the unbelieving world of what it's like when Jesus is king. We are supposed to be that foretaste and we're also an instrument of God's ac uh, redemptive activity in the world and we are a sign, a sign of the kingdom. And to be able to be a sign, we need gifts. We cannot do this in our own power. Jesus said he will build his church, but he gave us the keys of the kingdom. But he gave us power that accompanies that but not a triumphalistic power, but rather one that walks in humility, but also with courage. For that, he gave us spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit poured gifts and was poured out on all flesh and empowers the church. I'd like to finish with one story of something that happened to me in Puerto Rico when Angela and I were uh, planting a church, bearing witness uh, to God's coming kingdom in on the island of Puerto Rico, and Jesus was edifying his church there. One day I invited my co-pastor, Pastor Raul Orlandi, would you please bring the Bible study on Wednesday, which he did, and I'll never forget what he taught us. He read passages of the Spirit's uh, blessing and giving gifts to his people out of the New Testament, and then he gave us all these little pieces of a puzzle. And it was wrapped in a nice paper with a nice little bow on it. And some of us had two or three of it, of them. And we, we saw this gift. We said, thank you. What do we do with it? And the lady said, oh, you want us to open it? And he says, yes, go ahead. And so we opened that, and we saw that we had a piece of a puzzle in there. We, we put them together, and we saw that a beautiful image of a church in a valley with a beautiful rainbow there was uh, emerging from that puzzle. But then somebody said, Raul, there are pieces missing. And he says, that's right, sit down. And he read the passages of the New Testament again of the Spirit pouring his gifts on, God, on the church. And he said, these gifts have been given to each one of you. Some have one, some have two, some might have three. But these gifts and these talents that you have been given are for you to be a sign of the kingdom. They're of no use to you alone. They're only of use if you put them together with the gifts of others. And as you minister together, to the glory of God being a sign of the kingdom, Jesus will build his church. And the pieces that are missing, those are the people that are on the streets, in the, cafe, in the cafes, on the basketball courts, in the universities, in the schools. And as they are gathered, as we bear witness and are gathering them into God's church, Jesus will continue to bless. And we get to participate with him in bearing witness to the kingdom. It is my prayer, brothers and sisters who are listening today, that you might also see yourself as part of the church that Jesus himself is building, that this might be for the glory of God, for the edification of the church, and for the good of the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much to Juan for bringing God's word to us. And now we have the opportunity and the privilege of being met by God together. Even though we're all in individual places watching this morning, we get to come together to God's table of grace. And so whether you have some form of bread and some form of juice that you can eat and drink right now, or, or if you don't receive, receive the blessing of what 
the bread, Christ's body, and the, and the juice, the cup, Christ's blood um, mean for you. Christ's body has been given for you. His blood has been shed for you to be a part of his church, to be a part of the kingdom. Amen. Friends, let's sing together our sending song.
Friends, you are about to enter into every sector of public life to claim it for Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit. So as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.